Vid is the first protagonist character of the Pokemon franchise, and because Pokemon tends to inspire a lot of nostalgia within older players, that's usually what he's most famous for being. However, a second but no less important role he serves is that he also acts as the final opponent of the Johto games, only being unlocked after the player has completed both the Johto and Kanto portions and obtained all 16 badges. The sequence of climbing Mount Silver and coming face to face with Red is no doubt one of the franchise's most iconic moments, so I figured it'd be fun to dive into the game design aspects behind Red's boss fight. So, dear viewer, first question. What kind of role is Red supposed to fulfill within the Generation 2 games? This is an easy one. Red's a super boss, and a pretty traditional one too. Within the broad category of video game bosses, super bosses are one of the more niche archetypes, and in some ways, they can simultaneously be one of the most iconic player experiences in a game, while also being one of the lowest priority things to design and implement. See, super bosses are a type of optional special boss, which are characterized by their abnormal level of difficulty being far beyond the standard difficulty curve. It is not unusual for a super boss to be several magnitudes stronger and more difficult than the bosses which preceded it. Additionally, the mere process of unlocking them can be an ordeal in and of itself. They might require the player to complete an extensive post-game side quest, defeat many other bosses, pick certain specific dialogue options at key moments, or gather numerous rare items scattered across the game world in order to unlock them. And even when you do defeat them, the prize you get is effectively useless, because you've got no more difficult content left to use it on, assuming you even get anything at all because some games don't give you anything for all that effort. So to sum it up, you are intentionally going out of your way to get your ass kicked and getting nothing of value for it. This is because the very act of fighting the super boss is its own reward. Super bosses represent the ultimate test of skill which a game has to offer a player, and defeating them might require both knowledge of the game's mechanics and sufficient skill to keep up with the boss's actions. For many players, the experience of being confronted with a seemingly impossible challenge, being surprised by and learning the boss's mechanics, gradually making progress, and eventually succeeding is fun and engaging. Super bosses just take that basic experience to the extreme. All of this creates an air of mystery and exclusivity around these super bosses. The potentially unusual conditions to unlock them inspires intrigue and attracts curious players, and their sheer difficulty makes defeating them into an achievement which players within that game's community will recognize and acknowledge. People are just naturally attracted to things which are difficult or impossible to obtain. Ironically, this is also why super bosses tend to be a low priority to design and create. At the end of the day, game production is kept on a deadline, and a secret ultra difficult boss, which only a small portion of the player base will ever see, let alone defeat, is not exactly the most important thing in the world to make. Comparatively, a lot more focus tends to get placed on things which every player can be guaranteed to experience, such as the first boss or the final boss. But that isn't to imply that super bosses are unimportant or useless. It's just that they are more of a luxury rather than a necessity. Their optional, hidden and exclusive nature means that they aren't something that developers will actively think about until the later stages of development. A super boss is something great to have, but a game will still be fine without one, and there is likely to be a very long list of more important things which need to be finished before that. It all boils down to a matter of time, resources and opportunity costs. Some developers might lack or be unwilling to use their limited resources or budget on assets for a boss fight which only a few players will ever experience, when they could instead be putting those resources towards improving some other area of the game, or creating more general features which impact more players, or just general bug fixing. However, there are some ways to get around this problem. Certain games might reduce the overall production cost by reusing existing assets, such as by making an NPC like a shopkeeper or a separate playable character into the boss. And in the modern day, super bosses might be included as part of the DLC instead of being put in the base game, which is a point where the devs are less pressured with production. Gold and Silver opted for the first method. Red was the player character for the previous games, so the devs already had his sprites on hand, he didn't require any new Pokemon to be created, he had no dialogue to write or translate, and he reuses the game's existing battle music. All they needed to do was to make Mount Silver, which could be done using the existing cave, tile, environmental assets, and create the data for his boss battle and unlock conditions. Compared to the game's newer content such as the Johto bosses and Pokemon, Red was comparatively really cheap and quick to create because nearly all of the assets involved in his battle are reused or repurposed from elsewhere. 
Ordinarily, repurposing assets to such a heavy degree might risk being negatively perceived as lazy by players. However, Red's asset reuse was a major factor in what made him such a great super boss. This was only possible due to Gold and Silver's unique nature as a direct narrative sequel, something which only Black and White and their respective sequels can compare to. Sequels which reuse the same setting but introduce new characters and protagonists need to answer the question of what happened with the world and characters within that time skip between games. These questions get raised and answered as you explore Johto and Kanto, with the entire Team Rocket plotline having foundations in Giovanni's defeat, locations in Kanto such as Cinnabar Island having changed, and you meeting past characters like Lance, Bruno, Koga, Bill and Blue. So the question of what happened to the first game's player character might come up in players' minds, and the reveal that he acts as the game's super boss makes for a very satisfying answer. It takes advantage of a player's emotional emotional attachment to the previous game's avatar, answers the narrative question, and adds a dash of nostalgia on top. The reuse of sprite assets arguably benefits this, because Red's identical appearance ensures there is no ambiguity about his identity. And on a more meta-developmental level, all of this asset reuse might have been necessary to make this battle possible to begin with, because Kanto was a very late-stage addition to the games. It is a long-standing misconception that the late Nintendo CEO Satoru Iwata worked some programming magic and compressed the game into half of its size, making it possible to throw in Kanto. However, the truth is a lot more mundane. A relatively recent report by Did You Know Gaming clarifies that Mr. Iwata did do a source code analysis and help in plans for the game's international releases, but his programming code was actually used for optimizing load times, cutting out fractions of a second from very small things like battle start sequences and the Pokemon getting sent out. Doesn't sound like much, but it adds up to quite a lot when you consider just how frequently these minor things occur, so the total impact of Mr. Iwata's contribution was quite significant. Additionally, Mr. Iwata's code was actually taken and modified from Earthbound source code. Keep in mind, Mr. Iwata managed this while still handling his corporate executive duties, so that's some pretty impressive multitasking. The actual reason behind Kanto's inclusion was simply because the cartridge size doubled. Initially, the games were planned around half a megabyte cartridge, just like the Generation 1 games were. But partway through development, technological improvements allowed Game Freak to gain access to a 1 megabyte cartridge. Since Johto was originally planned to use half of that space, there would have been enough room to squeeze in a simplified version of Kanto. Because of this, reusing assets not only makes Red as a super boss feel more impactful, but might also have been necessary for this boss's creation to begin with. But what about Red's gameplay aspects? Well, like all other super bosses, Red was intended to be difficult, though the approach taken by the developers when designing him was surprisingly straightforward. Okay, to you, dear viewer, a quick pop quiz. Let me ask you this. Try to recall Red's team blindly from memory alone, and tell me, what is the first Pokemon that springs to mind, and what is the first thing about that Pokemon which stands out to you? You can let me know in the comments if you want, but I suspect that for many of you, the answer is Pikachu, his lead. And the most notable thing about that Pikachu? It's ridiculously high level of 81. Or if you're playing the remix, it's level 88. Back in my videos on Cynthia and Volo, I talked about the importance of the serial position effect when it comes to designing a boss. Human psychology is naturally biased towards remembering the first and last minutes of an experience over the middle part. So for bosses, the first actions they perform in their attack patterns are critical in communicating to the player about what the rest of the battle is going to be like. So for Red, what do you think his opening action tells you about his upcoming fight? Well, it tells you that he's going to be insanely overleveled, duh. As a comparison, Blue, the next highest level trainer in the game, was fought around the level 58 range. In the remix, you could seek him out for a bonus rematch like with the other gym leaders, where he's around the level 70 range. To put simply, there is an approximate 20-ish level gap between Red and the next highest level trainer, depending on your version. And sure, that the player will be entering this fight at a huge statistical disadvantage. 
Now, a super boss's difficulty could be due to a variety of sources. They might have unfairly powerful moves such as Street Fighter's Akuma, or have hyper-aggressive attack patterns which heavily pressurize you and demand fast reactions to keep up with, such as Yozora from Kingdom Hearts 3. But these are action-based games, meaning their super bosses test a player's mechanical skills and reactions. Turn-based RPG-style games typically lack such components, barring certain exceptions such as the Mario and Luigi RPG series, and instead test your understanding of their game's mechanics, your builds, and your preparation. These can be accomplished by setting special battle conditions or requirements. For example, in Persona 5 Royal, Lavenza's battle requires you to meet various different conditions which change based on the current phase, such as dealing specific elemental damage or needing to deal a crit every turn. Failing a condition triggers an immediate instant kill which wipes your whole party. This super boss tests your understanding of the game's mechanics and your Persona builds, as Lavenza's conditions can only be met by specific Persona fusion combinations and teammates. In Fire Emblem Awakening, Awakening, Priam's boss battle is a giant clash of armies that allows you to deploy a maximum of 30 characters, which is nearly every possible playable character that you could get in the game. And naturally, all of them need to be of a sufficient level to meaningfully contribute. This super boss tests your resources and total playtime invested. However, Pokemon as a game cannot do this. Turn-based super bosses like these are only possible because they are set up with special enemies and mechanical rules rules which a player cannot replicate or have access to. Pokemon's defining trait as a franchise is that every monster can be obtainable by the player, meaning that the super boss cannot be allowed to have an exclusive Pokemon which gives them a huge advantage over the player. Final bosses like Steven's Metagross and Getsus's Hydreigon sidestep this problem because there is still more game content available after their battles, meaning that they can be made obtainable as part of the post game. Either due to only being catchable then or because of level requirements. However, super bosses like Red are designed as the end point of all game content. By this point, players will have seen every Pokemon the game has to offer, so the game has nothing special left in reserve to surprise you with. Setting Red's Pokemon to be monstrously overleveled is the easiest and most straightforward way to create a difficulty wall between him and Blue. The players should be very familiar with Pokemon's level system and other basic RPG concepts by now, so seeing a Pikachu nearly 20 levels above your team very easily communicates to the player that this will be a difficult fight that they are likely not yet prepared for. That said, designing the super boss using level advantage alone does have some advantages. Like I mentioned before, super bosses are sometimes some of the easiest bosses to design in games because they are intentionally super difficult and unfair to fight against by design, meaning that designers don't need to take as much care to ensure that the fight is balanced. For other bosses, if the game designer accidentally makes them too difficult, they end up being an unintentional roadblock that impedes the player's game experience. Whitney and her mill tank are a good example of this, causing many players years ago to be stuck in Goldenrod for far longer than the developers likely originally intended. This in turn messes up the difficulty curve for later content, as the trap player would grind levels to overcome that roadblock, making them too overleveled for the later battles, and making those challenges far easier than intended. But since there is no content left after the super boss, the game developers don't need to worry and can make them as unfairly difficult as possible. It doesn't matter if the difficulty exceeds expectations, because players will just naturally accept that as part of the super boss's natural difficulty. Other bosses would often make use of troublesome Pokemon and novel strategies such as Morty's Dream Eater or Chuck's Dynamic Punch RNG spam. The intent would be to present players with an unusual situation which they then need to solve using strategy or specific Pokemon or grind enough levels to get past. But Red doesn't have any strategy because the level advantage alone makes him into a giant wall of stats, so the developers were free to give him almost any Pokemon because he'd still manage to pose a challenge due to stats alone. Thus the developers opted for a thematic team over anything actually practical. In this case, they selected Pokemon that a player would be almost guaranteed to have when playing through Red and Blue. Players will naturally 
usually always keep their starter in their teams. So to reflect this, Red was given Venusaur, Blastoise, and Charizard, accurately representing all players regardless of their choice in starter. Pikachu is also there as the starter of Yellow, and obviously it has special privileges as the series mascot. Snorlax is a compulsory roadblock which every player needs to clear in order to advance past the mid-game portion of Kanto, therefore making this into a Pokemon which every player is 100% guaranteed to face and potentially capture. And lastly, Lapras and Espeon are the two gift Pokemon that you can get for free. In the original, you'd fight Espeon, likely to show it off as a new evolution, but the remakes replaced it with Lapras, maybe because Espeon being a new evolution might make the connection less obvious, or because Lapras is an overall stronger Pokemon. Note that apart from Pikachu, all of his Pokemon are certainly good and above average, but there's nothing truly outstanding. All of his Pokemon also have straightforward and somewhat unimpressive movesets, and the most dangerous Pokemon of this group is Snorlax, which is still fairly reasonable to take on. There is no pseudo-legendary like Lance's Dragonite, or difficult to handle types like Claire's Kingdra, or problematic moves like Whitney's Attract. The developers didn't just casually give him a Tyranitar or something to make him difficult. This is the concession made on Red's design. Red's Pokemon are not that powerful. Levels are all he has, and all he needs. If a player is able to grind enough to match Red in levels, they can easily win. As a super boss, Red is a test of your resources, time investment, and general commitment to continuously play the game. Generation 2 in general had an interesting push to daily regular play compared to Generation 1. The introduction of multiple time-based mechanics such as trainer rematches via Pokegear, and events that take place based on the day of the week all seem to encourage the player to play through gold and silver at a slower pace, spread out over the course of many shorter play sessions. Red's huge level advantage could possibly be implemented with this in mind. It's so that Red will serve as something for players to slowly and gradually work their way towards over the course of several days or weeks of daily play sessions, as you explore two whole regions worth of walkable area. But that was in Generation 2, back when Pokemon's game design was still in its early years and was less established compared to modern times. Having a Super Boss's main challenge be purely due to levels and nothing else might work back in the 90s, but it definitely wouldn't in this current day and age. So when the time came to remake Gold and Silver in Generation 4, Red's battle was also updated accordingly to have a bit more mechanical depth. Back in GSC, Red's Pokemon had a number of unremarkable and useless moves, such as Mud Slap on Espeon, Slash on Charizard, and Snore on Snorlax. Snorlax itself could also be casually walled by any Ghost, Rock, or Steel type since it only had normal attacks. And in general, his team only seemed to have their main type move and relatively little else. Over the years, Pokemon move pools would become less restrictive and expand due to the addition of new TMs and mechanics, and Red was updated accordingly. His new team now boasts attacks from a wide variety of types, providing him with greater versatility and letting him threaten players in ways outside of just stats and big numbers. Pikachu was also upgraded from being a cute deadweight mascot into an actual threat and team member, as the Light Ball and Volt Tackle now make it a serviceable Glass Cannon new. So if the player cannot outspeed Pikachu from the start, they might end up getting completely swept. Additionally, Red's battle is uniquely the only battle in the game with a special condition. It takes place under a permanent hail, which will consistently chip down both teams' health over time. The reworks make this into an advantage for Red, because half of his team are given a perfect accuracy blizzard to abuse, and his new Lapras is immune to the chip damage. These changes all add some much-needed strategic depth to what was formerly a really straightforward fight. In the past, fighting Red was just a one-dimensional matter of grinding levels and bashing yourself against a wall of stats. But now there's a few more complications for a player to strategically consider. You need to consider whether to outspeed or wall Pikachu, you need to play around his multi-type team and type coverage attacks, you could opt to change the weather to remove the Hail and Blizzard benefits, or you could also try to play around the Hyper Beam clones which four of his Pokemon are equipped with. And the additions of the physical special split and new generation 4 evolutionary lines means that the player has a lot more options compared to before. But don't worry, levels are still a major factor. The remakes made changes to address many of Johto's design problems, with one of those being the game's anemic lack of EXP. In the original games, Johto had an infamously poor level curve, and Kanto was a fairly bare-bones experience. Grinding enough EXP to approach Red's level was a marathon and might take several days, because there were very few reliable farmable sources of EXP, and the Elite Four never updated beyond their initial teams within the 
level 40 range. In Heart Gold Soul Silver, Johto's level curve saw some improvement, and Kanto is now greatly expanded with more meaningful content. EXP is also more readily available, with bonus weekly gym leader rematches being added and the Elite 4 getting updated rematch teams with higher levels. Compared to the past, Kanto and Johto now contain more content and EXP in general, making leveling up to Challenge Red much less of a chore than before. To compensate for this, Red's levels were buffed. As of Heart Gold Soul Silver, Red's team had the highest levels out of all trainers within the franchise, and he went uncontested with regards to that for over a decade. Eventually, Cynthia would come to share the title in her Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl final rematch, and Kieran of all people also follows suit in his final rematch in Scarlet and Violet's Indigo Disc DLC. This ultimately highlights the weakness in designing a super boss around levels and stats alone. As the game series goes on, numerical stat creep is an inevitability, and what was originally an impossibly overwhelming number loses a lot of impact and shock value over the years. Nowadays, younger players won't be particularly alarmed as Kieran sends out a level 87 Hydrapple, because EXP has become so plentiful that levels don't mean much anymore. So they might look back at Red and think he's a bit overhyped and not a big deal due to his seemingly mediocre team of Kanto Pokemon, an impression which is unfortunately supported by his more modern battle appearances. Red may be fought as a bonus boss in Black and White 2's World Tournament and Sun and Moon's Battle Tree, where he uses variations of his Heart Gold Soul Silver team. In these environments, everyone's teams are locked to level 50, and with the lack of level advantage, the statistical flaws of Red's Pokemon choices become more obvious, and he might arguably end up being one of the easiest among those bonus bosses as a result. And then there's Let's Go, where Red can be fought with whatever the heck this team is, with no items at all and extremely odd movesets. Seriously, there's a Machamp with special moves, Lapras with physical moves, a Toxic Stall Snorlax, and a Mega Drain Venusaur. Why? By this point, Pokemon's battle mechanics have now grown and evolved to the point where levels alone aren't the end-all be-all factor that they used to be. Pokemon super bosses can no longer pose a meaningful challenge based on levels alone. They actually need great team compositions or battle gimmicks too. In my personal, entirely biased opinion, I don't know if it's even possible to design a supremely challenging Pokemon super boss via conventional means anymore. There is now such a huge variety of Pokemon available to the player, and leveling up is now made so easy that a super boss would need to break the game's rules to pose any sort of challenge, like how Volo uses 8 Pokemon. Maybe Legend ZA will have us fight, I don't know, Professor Sycamore's ancestor who uses all 3 Zygarde forms or something. I don't know. At this point, Red's a bit of a relic in terms of game design. He's more so a chapter in the franchise's long history than an actual character, and a super boss that belongs to a much simpler times in both gaming and our lives in general. He's very much a defining part of what made the Johto games so amazing as a game experience, in spite of their flaws, and made for an incredible finale for those few kids who managed to reach, face, and surpass him. Even as the series and game design in general continues to evolve, we shall still look back to Red and the Gold and Silver games with fondness. Not just for nostalgia's sake, but for also setting a standard of what it means to be a super boss. But what about you, my dear viewer? What is your own story with Red? Do you agree with my video's key points or disagree? Tell me about your own personal experience with his battle within the comments below. If you've enjoyed this video, then leave me a like. In the meantime, here's another video because there's always more to talk about regarding the finer details of game design. I look forward to seeing you there. Till next time.